There is only one fastest car in the world, only one fastest motorcycle, and only one fastest EV. There are hundreds of different classes in land speed racing, each having their own record. Want to build a supercharged methanol injected modified rear engine roadster with a 305 cubic inch engine? There's a record for that, and it's 194.848 miles per hour. For electric cars, there are far fewer records, only three in the SCTA rulebook split up by weight. But if you want to say that you have the fastest EV in the world, only one vehicle can claim that title. For a long time, that claim was held by the Buckeye Bullet, designed and built by students at The Ohio State University. It set a record at just over 341 miles per hour. The fastest EV in the world. But that claim has recently been taken by two Teslas and a car that was built in 1958. Electric vehicles have been setting land speed records for a while. In fact, the first car of any kind to go faster than 100 kilometers per hour was an electric vehicle. Most of the people racing on the Bonneville Salt Flats are doing it with internal combustion. This mostly has to do with economy of scale. It's pretty cheap to go to a junkyard and find a few hundred internal combustion horsepower to shove in your streamliner. That hasn't really been the case with electric vehicles up until, well, now. And that's essentially what Team Vesco wanted to do when they asked Revolt Systems to help them break the EV record. They did it, and in an incredibly short four months. The hardest part of it was the time frame. That was the biggest kicker, because we really didn't have any time to test. We had to make sure everything was done 100% right. They did have one advantage, though. The car already existed. In fact, it had existed for 63 years. It was put to paper in 1957, and they ran it in 1958. They call this the Little Giant, and it has several records set over decades and generations. Team Vesco is a multi-generational team that has consistently been building some of the fastest vehicles. They have the record for the world's fastest wheel-driven car. This is the only vehicle that has ever gone 500 miles per hour on the salt flats that doesn't have a rocket engine or jet engine blasting thrust out the back. This car has several records because it has run in several different classes. They do this by swapping out the powertrain. This car has had everything from a nitromethane injected small block Chevy to a Ford Model B engine. So to make it break another record, the powertrain was again swapped out. And they gave me basically a breakdown of how much horsepower it needs to go X amount of speed. Um, I know what a Tesla motor does. And I'm like, well, that's kind of a little outside of what a Tesla motor is capable of doing. So let's put two of them in there. Two Tesla performance drive units, each making about 635 horsepower. So, you do the math. To say that you have the world's fastest EV, you need to go faster than that Buckeye bullet speed, which means you need to go 342 miles per hour. The recipe for hitting that speed is one little giant, two Tesla motors, and some batteries. The real challenge, though, is integration, getting the motors to work in a car they were not designed for, but that's kind of what these guys do. Their business is taking Tesla motors, reconfiguring them with a different gearing, and then destroying some perfectly good tires. Tesla refers to this as a drive unit. It is comprised of the electric motor, the inverter, which takes the battery voltage and converts it to whatever AC voltage the motor needs at any given moment, and the differential and gears. Revolt makes electric crate motors by disassembling the inverter from the motor, flipping it around behind it, and then swapping in new reduction gears. For this car, they did basically the same thing, except instead of moving the inverter behind the motor, they put it beside it, stacking two motors on top of each other and then putting the two inverters on the sides. The motors are attached together with a Gates belt. This is the kind of thing you'd see on a supercharger for a dragster. It's actually a pretty efficient way to transmit lots of power. Team Vesco uses three of these on their turbinator car, one to get the power from the turbine engine to the drive shaft, and then one at each end to get the power from the drive shaft to the differentials. This roller here puts the right tension on the belt and allows more of the belt teeth to be engaged. So the top motor attaches to the bottom motor with belts, and the bottom motor just goes straight back to the differential, which sends the power to the wheels. But can you just attach two Tesla motors together and get twice the horsepower? Is it really that simple? The part that I thought would be uh, like the most challenging was, was a lot easier than I thought was putting the motors together and getting them to synchronize because we're running two separate computer systems, two separate inverters, two separate motors, and I was a little worried that one would be overpowering the other, they wouldn't quite synchronize RPMs correctly, even though they are belted, 
one would be working harder than the other and we'd have some issues there. And after our first run, I, I took the data and I was like, wow, we're within 15 amps of each other. And then I think our second run, I, I came back and we're within four amps of each other, which is insane. As for gear reduction, Tesla normally has a pretty high reduction around nine to one. The little giant is running around two to one. There are two reasons for this. One is that they are going a lot faster than a Tesla, over twice as fast. The other reason is a little counterintuitive if you're used to internal combustion engines. Those engines usually make the most power at the highest RPM, so you want them spinning as fast as possible. This is not true with the Tesla motors. You want to keep that motor under 8,000 RPM. You don't want to go past 8,000 RPM on those motors. They, they start to drop off in torque after that. Getting all this in a car required some significant modifications to the frame around the engine bay. Already having the car meant that they didn't have to make all that stuff, but it did mean that they had to work around all that stuff, and in some cases, modify parts of the car. The two frame rails that were running down to hold this original Chevy motor in it were just too narrow. So I had Al from AVS Fabrication help us out, and he cut this chassis up for me, widened everything, and read it all of that without touching the body. So from the outside, it looks identical. From the inside, we got a lot more room to play. Normally, the go pedal would be attached to the throttle, but the pedal here is attached to another pedal. This is actually the easiest way to control the Tesla motor. You just use the Tesla pedal. Doing it this way has the advantage of keeping all the original controls where they were, so the person driving the car doesn't have to worry about a different pedal in a different place. He can just focus on going really fast. You can't just plug a Tesla throttle pedal into a Tesla motor and go. The Tesla motors are looking for a Tesla car, and you need a little black box that is good at pretending to be a Tesla car. EV Controls sells one of these boxes called the T2C that will interface with an iPad to give you feedback on your motor performance, voltage, temperature, etc. Revolt used two of these to control the two motors. So the motor is in the car, the inverters are in the car, the inverters are hooked up to the motors, which are hooked up to each other, and the tires through the rear end, which makes this whole thing go. One last thing. The batteries, as it turns out, are the hard part. By the way, this is actually true for EV swaps right now. The challenge is not fitting a smaller, lighter motor in, but fitting in a very large, very heavy battery. This will get easier with time as batteries get smaller, unless Tesla and other companies keep gooping them together in awkwardly large modules, but that is a story for another time. The battery in this car was originally a Tesla Model S P100D battery, reconfigured into a package that looks something like this. These motors are making a bit under 650 horsepower each, which means that together they're pulling around 1,000 kilowatts from the battery at full tilt. 1,000 kilowatts. A megawatt. With this package all put together, the team headed out to Speed Week on the Bonneville Salt Flats in August of this year. For the first shakedown run, they set a maximum output of the motors to 250 kilowatts each, about half of their capability. Then we bumped it up to 300 per motor. And then that's when we're like, oh cool, it's not really running much faster. What's going on here? They came back to the pits, messed with the tuning, messed with the cooling, and tried again, but they couldn't get the car past 300 miles per hour. As it turns out, a Tesla P100D battery isn't really up to the task of continually putting out a megawatt for five miles straight. The motors worked great, the gearing, the inverters, the controls, everything was working except the batteries. So, new batteries. <laughs> Batteries hold an amount of energy in them. This is what Tesla means when they say P85 or P100D. The P is for performance motor, the D is for dual motor, and the 100 is for 100 kilowatt hours. This means that if you had a one kilowatt flashlight, this battery would power it for 100 hours. That would be an absurdly bright flashlight. But what if you went bigger? If you had a 10 kilowatt flashlight, this battery would power it for 10 hours. And a 100 kilowatt flashlight would be powered for one hour. But eventually it starts to break down. If you had a 1000 kilowatt flashlight, this battery could theoretically power it for one tenth of an hour, but this battery can't output that much power. It has a limit. This limit is called the C rating, and it's a multiple of the battery's capacity. So Tesla's 100 kilowatt hour battery seems to be able to put out about 500 kilowatts continuously. So we would say this battery has a continuous C rating of five. Battery manufacturers will publish C ratings of continuous and usually a higher C rating that's only good for 10 seconds. This is probably true of the Tesla pack. While it might do 5C indefinitely, it might be able to put out something like 15C for 10 seconds. That would be plenty of power for the dual motors, but a land speed run takes longer than 10 seconds and less time than indefinitely. So it's hard to know what the battery is capable of without just putting it in a car and sending it down the salt. So they did that and they found out they needed some other batteries.
So the search was on. We had those uh, Honda Insight little prismatic cells. I was literally short circuiting them right behind you with jumper cables. And I had my, my amp clamps on it and voltmeters and trying to figure out how much sag they had. And they were pretty stiff little guys. They just don't have a lot of density. Different batteries have different limits. Some batteries are designed to output more power. They do this by changing the chemistry, and usually it's a trade-off. A battery that can output more power might weigh more for the same total energy storage. But here's the deal. If you have a hybrid car, you usually don't want a giant 100 kilowatt hour battery. You want something like maybe 5 kilowatt hours, but you still need to put out lots of power to move the car. Those batteries are designed to spit out lots of power at the expense of being a bit heavier and larger. So Revolt got some of those batteries. Lots of them. 1,152 of them. They stacked 96 of them together 12 times, connecting them all with stacks of laser-cut copper bus bars. These battery cells are not liquid-cooled like the Tesla cells, they are air-cooled. They did this by spacing them out slightly and leaving an air gap in between each pouch. Then they put a fan on the back of the case to pull air through. That's more or less used in the pit because while the car is moving, most of the air is being rammed down inside of it through these ducts that you see right here. And then there's a big air box that they're connected to right behind the driver. And then we have a huge gasket that goes around the whole front of the battery that actually pushes that air through. They were still not putting out the near megawatt that the motors are capable of. They have a higher discharge capability, but doing so over five miles is a lot to ask of any batteries. So they were not quite putting down 1,270 horsepower. It was closer to 1,000. The team loaded up the car and headed back out to Bonneville this last September for the World Finals Land Speed Racing event. The world of land speed racing is a little more complicated than it probably should be. There are FIA records, BNI records, East Coast Timing Association, Southern California Timing Association, each with their own records and rules. The fastest EV record of them all is the FIA record set by the Buckeye Bullet at 341.264 miles per hour. Or at least it was until Eric Ritter drove the Little Giant at 353 miles per hour, setting an official national EV record and besting the FIA world record by 12 miles per hour. What's next for this car? Well, it's going back in time. The electric powertrain is coming out and it's getting replaced with the original Ford Model B engine that this car was built with. But the mounts for the electric powertrain will be staying in the car. There is more speed to be had with the Tesla motors. They weren't even at 100% power. The Model S performance motors need to be cooled better because they're not really designed for this kind of prolonged high power use. Tesla's newer motors manage heat much better and they're smaller, especially the inverter. So this space here where there are two motors, maybe you could fit four plaid motors. EV land speed racing is getting really fast, but they still have a long way to go to catch up with the internal combustion cars. 353 is fast, but the fastest piston engine car has gone over 100 miles per hour faster than that. And the fastest wheel driven car, that turbine engine powered thing, has hit a top speed of 503 miles per hour. 350 may not seem too far from 500, but aerodynamic drag is exponential. It doesn't take twice the power to go twice as fast, it takes exponentially more. This car has over 3,000 horsepower, this one has 5,000. That's five of these guys, and you still need a battery that's able to spit out enough electricity to power a small town. But the kind of people who go to Bonneville are the kind of people who just want to do something that nobody else has done before. Someday the EVs will get there, maybe someday soon. It took 63 years for this car to go from a Model B to a Model S. In another 63 years, it will be 2084. And I like to think this car will be out here with some new powertrain we can't imagine, trying to break another record. It used to be that you had to impress people to get people to watch your show. Now you just have to impress the algorithm. So do me a favor, hit that subscribe button. All hail the algorithm. <laughs>